Um, my name is Shahid Zahid, and uh, I'm in, going to be in, uh, well, talking to uh, Professor Spiro Polalis. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, let me just give you one minute on, on who I am. I'm an economist by, uh, by profession, uh, and I'm a development practitioner. Um, I taught economics for about 15 years, and for s several decades I worked with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, I recently took my retirement. That's all I'm going to say about myself. Um, I'm really here to uh, introduce uh, Professor Spiro Polalis. Professor S Spiro Polalis, uh, if you want to know more about him, you can Google him. You'll find lots of information on the web, but let me give you uh, a few um, highlights of his career, uh, which I have made some notes. I hope I'm correct, and if I'm wrong, please correct me. May I call you Spiro? Absolutely, yes. Um, well, Professor Spiro Polalis is a professor at the Harvard School of Design, where he has been for the last 33 years. He started there in 1986. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, MIT. After finishing his undergraduate studies in Greece, he did a PhD from uh, MIT in applied mechanics. He has uh, two additional degrees uh, in ocean and civil engineering, also from MIT. And then he subsequently went on and did an MBA as well. Um, he currently runs a program which has the name the Zofnas Program for Sustainability. It's a sustainability system for rating infrastructures. It started in the US and I believe it is now worldwide. Yes. Um, or it's being applied worldwide in many countries across the world. Um, Professor Polalis has uh, is working as a planner in Pakistan since 2010. Um, the two works that I would like to mention are, uh, he's working on the DHA city in Karachi and the LDA city in Lahore. He's also uh, working on projects in Saudi Arabia. These are urban and city planning projects in Saudi Arabia and Malaysia. Um, he's also currently leading the development of the former Athens airport, um, which is being converted into, uh, is being developed into, a, into an expansion of the city, extension of the, of the city of Athens. Uh, that's a very brief introduction. Um, Spira is going to be talking to us about, um, not just about the, the Greek who built Islamabad, but about this gentleman called Konstantinos Toxiadis and his uh, vision for city planning and urban planning. And uh, we hope that this conversation will um, take us to areas beyond Islamabad and some of the more interesting, more recent work that Spiro has been involved with. So uh, before anything else, let me pose my first question to Spiro. Oh, sorry, before I, before I begin, uh, we will take some uh, questions at the, at the very end. So uh, if you have any questions or um, something to ask uh, Professor Polalis, uh, we'll give you ample time at the end. Uh, we will be in conversation and uh, I will give the stage mainly to Spiro so he can tell you all about this exciting work and projects that he's been involved with. Um, before we uh, get on to Islamabad, Spiro, it would be interesting if you could tell us not just about the vision for Islamabad, about this gentleman, Konstantinos Doxiadis, and what his vision and his philosophy were. Thank you very much. Uh, I can call you Shahid as well. Yes, yes please. <laughs> very good. Actually, we know each other for a long time. Closer. Okay, not so close, <laughs> but anyway, we know each other for a long time, so this is a good uh, occasion to have the conversation, and uh, we're going to carry this as a conversation. So, talking about Doxiadis, uh, I was a young assistant professor at Harvard. It was uh, late 80s, and I organized an event, 
And I invited uh, a colleague of mine from the Kennedy School of Government who was quite old. And professors at Harvard or in the United States do not retire unless they want to retire. So he was still active in his uh, mid-80s. And uh, he came, uh, we're all very surprised that he accepted. And he came and he says, I'm here because you're Greek. And I knew very well Konstantinos Doxiadis. And he praised him so much to me that I felt that if that happens at Harvard, if it happens at the School of Government, uh, it means something more. So this is the first anecdote I would like to say. Uh, and it was really very moving. So, talking about Doxiadis. Uh, Doxiadis was a planner, and I'm going to tell you another anecdote. I would like to have this more as a friendly conversation today. Uh, the story is that when he said to his wife, uh, his wife asked, his future wife asked, what are you doing? What is your job? He said, I plan cities. And she laughed. And she felt that he was crazy. How someone can plan cities. And we're talking here about uh, very early 50s, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, of course, today things are different. Uh, here in Pakistan, you have cities being built uh, frequently. Uh, I'm pretty sure you all know the cities that are going on. And uh, this is a result of uh, the growth of population that you experience. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, to start ahead with this photograph. Doxiadis was very meticulous in keeping diaries. And his diaries are in the archives that they are in the Benaki Museum in Athens. And uh, this photograph is from his diaries. And uh, it's taken when he visited Islamabad. And unfortunately, the screens we have are not big enough. Uh, but basically, th that was the view of where Islamabad is today. And I wanted to start with this photograph because it presents the challenges, the issues. Imagine you are in his shoes and you look at that and many years later it's going to be a city of one and a half million people, 1.2, and uh, you have the responsibility of how these people are going to live, how they're going to work, how they're going to entertain, how they're going to worship, how they're going to raise their kids, and all this starting from a photograph like this. And this is happening until today, when you plan cities here in Pakistan, it all starts with an area that basically there is nothing there, and the planners are called to impose order and build a city. So uh, if I should go ahead, uh, yes. yes. Uh, so let's look at his vision and some of the comments that he made. Uh, here we see him uh, talking, giving a lecture, and in the lower part we see part of Islamabad. And in that lower part of Islamabad we can see a lot of different things uh, about how he has planned the city, but we're going to see that later. But let's read this material here, and unfortunately I do not see it, so if you allow me. My computer as well, so I can have uh, closer access. Uh, so basically, this is what he said about cities. Uh, he was very critical, and uh, yes, exactly. But uh, before that, I need I need to turn on this so I can follow as well. Just a minute. Good. So basically, he was very critical about, about how things were done. And uh, at that time, he was referring primarily to existing cities, although uh, Le Corbusier was building uh, Chantigar and also Brasilia. And he was saying that we're building the wrong cities for the future, wasting and spoiling natural resources and allowing man to lose his importance inside the cities due to traffic and pollution. The cities of the future will be extra human in dimension. Therefore, our task is to create them as a web of many communities 
with human dimensions. Now, when he says extra human in dimension, he simply means it's going to be much bigger than human, inhumane, and said we have to build them in a different way. This is very telling, thinking that this is said uh, 1968 and how correct he was. If we continue, uh, he basically criticized cities for human, uh, losing the human scale, that they were not satisfactory to their inhabitants, that the elements of contemporary cities, such as transportation, zoning, and communication, were not longer in balance. And please pay attention, transportation, zoning, and communication. And as a result, people suffered in cities that they were too large, crowded, noisy, and that exacted too much damage on the surrounding natural environment. I'm pretty sure all these things resonate with you. And uh, according to Doxiadis, the greatest problem facing cities worldwide was the problem of managing growth. The biggest problem we have is overpopulation. We have to accommodate more and more people. And he argued that Sydney planners made very inadequate provisions for urban growth, and as a result, cities would grow like cancers. And what does he mean by cancer? The inner city is going to start eating the surrounding areas, the surrounding areas that will start eating the natural areas in a way that was not planned, and it would propagate like cancer. And he said, Planners must find a way to restore human scale to larger cities. Oh, yes. Actually, yes. Uh, so, sorry. I, 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 I'm supposed to do that. So, say, yes. Uh, okay, very good. So, th these are some thoughts about Doxiadis. Right. Now, it's very interesting. Uh, sorry. Yeah, Hamudi, we, Hamid, please, we don't need more directions. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's very interesting what you said. Uh, basically, the idea that he came up with was that um, the, the human element would be center of the city, and it's basically developing a city starting with that human dimension. And he mentioned these extra human dimensions, and you said that cities are generally inhumane structures, but we have to center them around human beings and move from there. He came up with a particular philosophy uh, that uh, encapsulated these ideas, uh, human beings, uh, environmental sustainability, sustainability of cities, and the growth of cities. And I think he gave it a name, um, Echistics, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it was a new, na new name which had been derived from various uh, Greek uh, terminology. Uh, would you like to just tell us a little bit about what this philosophy of Echistics was? And and how it came about and what exactly it encapsulates? Uh, uh, absolutely. So in order to face all these things, he developed a theory that, as you said, it's called dichistics. If you can go to Z, and then uh, if you can hit uh, echistics. No, and go to echistics. Yes, there's exactly. A, a, yeah. Yes, the theory of echistics. Uh, actually, it happens to be the same. Image. So let's see if I can move it. Yes, I can move it. So basically he said, we have to approach this in a scientific, organized way. Uh, and this is where I find it to be very interesting. In other words, he approaches as a management, business, economics problem at the same time. And basically he says that this new science of acoustics is going to be an interdisciplinary effort to arrive at the proper concept and implementation of the facts, concepts and ideas related to, my, to a human settlement. And I'm going to point out also, he was talking about human settlements. That was his definition of uh, cities, urban centers, and so on. Just giving emphasis, as Sahid, you said very well, about people. And uh, his research and his theories uh, were based on the man and the human settlements. Uh, the man and the city, the relationship. And he drew these very simple graphics that you see, but then he started thinking about dynamic settlements. And by dynamic, we introduced the concept of time and how things change with time and things are not static. 
and he went all the way to the ecistics design and science. And he calls it design because it cannot be taught, it cannot have specific rules, but it's also a science because it can have specific rules as well and can be taught as a science. And if we proceed, then uh, he said that the human settlements must be approached as a synthesis of five elements. Again, we're talking about uh, the 50s here. The first is nature. And he says the ecosystem in which man and society operate and citizen settlements are placed must be in balance. We have to respect nature. The second one, immediately after nature, was man. By man here we mean a person. Unfortunately, in English, we do not have uh, the word anthropos, which is the Greek word that's being used in some literary circles. Uh, we do not mean just men, we mean men and women. And the man starts in the center, the individual human being. Going back again, Sahir, to what you said. And then it's society. It's society that many men and women together they deal with their interrelationship, with trends, with behavior, with customs, but also with jobs, which is a very central part, the economy, central part. And that's why I'm very happy that I'm talking to an economist today. Uh, this is the best counterpart to a planner. And then he talks about cells. And he uses the term cells as a generic term for all buildings and structures in the man-made environment, and finally the networks that connect the cells, like transportation, communications, and all the infrastructure. Pay attention to this, this is very important. And actually, the way he puts it, and we see him teaching, he makes this the tridron, but at the same time, when he puts it in graphics, although he starts with nature, he puts man on the top, in a way not knowing exactly what is more important, is it man or is it nature? And then, uh, if we proceed, then says ecistics is a science. We have to study, we can analyze, we can have rules. And uh, sometimes it is technology, sometimes it is art, but cannot work without the foundations of a science. And this is a mistake, he says, that we pay very heavily. Now, you understand that when I come from an engineering, mathematics background, business background, they hear all these things, this is really intriguing, because this is not just nice watercolors on paper. So the acoustics of scales is first the architecture, which is the acoustics of the micro scale, then it is the acoustics of the middle scale, which is urbanism, and then the acoustics of the large scale, which is regional planning and planning. And then he says, if it is sciences, we have to look which sciences, and he puts acoustics in the middle, and he puts economics on the very top, right. which is very, very interesting. And then sociology, cultural disciplines, political science administration. And then you see architecture and how you make the cells is the technical disciplines. And if you look at that graphically, it is not as an important component. And I want you to see the cities like this. However, let me give you a trick here. Uh, Doxiadis was an amazing uh, speaker. Some of you told me in private conversations that you had m met when you were very young uh, boys and girls uh, visiting Islamabad. And uh, although we see this graph, 90% of his team were architects and planners. Because, but nevertheless, he was putting all the others. But he had all the disciplines, and he was good in managing all of them and understanding all of them. So if we continue briefly, we see that the human settlements are living organisms, Sahid, as we would have said very many times, yes. and capable of evolution. And an evolution that might be guided by man using the acoustic knowledge. And here he put some graphics with different combinations of the five components, the five uh, sciences, and eventually he goes back to the sectors uh, and the communities that we see on the right that we're going to see more detail with the examples that we're going to see later. 
So this is, in a nutshell, the theory of echistics, just to get an idea. Of course, it's much more. There is a whole society of echistics. There are publications. Uh, many people have spent their time on echistics, and Islamabad is the par excellence example of how echistics were applied uh, in city planning. Yeah. If you can go to Z, very good. Thank you, Spiro. Uh, now, there's a lot of literature, as Spiro mentioned, on echistics that's available, and I'm sure um, given um, access to the web these days, you can download any of these. There's publications, there's uh, work written on echistics by um, um, Doxiadis himself, and there are subsequent publications. There's a whole society of echistics as well. Uh, but the, the, the thing that in, uh, interested me most was a couple of things. One, that it is all based around the person, the human being, the men and women that inhabit these cities. Um, cities are going to be looked at as organisms that grow. He talks about growing like a cancer where the inner city takes over and invades the, the, the rest of the city. But also... Uh, nature and the environment, and, and especially giving thought to how these people are going to inhabit those cities, how they live, how their families will inhabit those cities, how their children will grow up, where they will go to work, where they will go to play, where they will go to study. So it's a, it's a, it's a holistic view based around people. It's not about concrete and mortars and bricks and steel and and, and glass and, and you know, digging holes and building structures. It's essentially planning a city, no matter what the structures look like, making sure that the people that are living there are comfortable, healthy, in a safe environment, and they have all the amenities at their disposal, and they have accessibility. So access is a major aspect of, of this planning, if I'm not mistaken. And I think we need to talk around those areas some more. So if you have any ideas, and perhaps we can talk about Islamabad, uh, in particular the plan for Islamabad, uh, how that evolved, and um, you know, we can talk about what happened to it in the future. But as you said, it's a city of about 1.2 to 1.4 million people. Um, it was designed as a self-contained city where people who worked there would also live there. But of course, that's not the case anymore. There's a lot of people that are migrating on a daily basis back and forth from Rawalpindi, the, 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 the twin city. So people are going back and forth. I don't think that was the original plan, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? It, it, uh, yes. it, was, it was not the original plan. And uh, let you go to sectors, if you can put your mouse on. Uh, under echistics, there is one word that says sectors. Very good. So. Uh, you remember he said, cities within cities. And uh, of course, you're familiar with the term sector here in Pakistan. This is how you call the sectors in Islamabad and uh, probably in Korangi. And the sector is uh, basically ideally put as a square of two by two kilometers. And within that sector, you have the residences, but at the same time, you have several centers of the sector. And the centers of the sector are the sector, uh, actually the center five that we see on the left. Uh, and on sector five, it's uh, business and light industry. And uh, it's only 20 minutes to walk from that to the most further away uh, residences. And then he breaks the sector in four quarters and each quarter has its own center, which is center four, and this is only 10 minutes walk, and then he breaks it to another subsector, now one sixteenth of the whole thing, and this is only five minutes walk, and he puts different activities in the centers. So as a result, people who live in the sector, they can have all their basic amenities and we're going to see later what, which are those amenities, but every day, shopping, uh, small businesses, uh, schools, uh, playgrounds, kindergartens, uh, mosques, are all in those centers. And uh, if we go to the next, uh, oh, I'm sorry. In 
the next slide, uh, we talked about expansion. And here on the left, you see the static way he calls of the past. Unfortunately, we see it until today, where the city is at the center, and around the center, we built the rest of the, uh, of the residences. And, uh, and then as it expands, this, we're in this middle gra graphic here. Uh, as it expands, it eats, and the one eats the other, and uh, they change use. And he says, that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to have an evolution, to give a way for the business, a way for the industry to grow in a certain direction that we have thought from the beginning, so it is linear, and that way will not need to eat into residential or other uses, but it's going to go linearly. And uh, he talks about the kinetic fields of residences, in other words, how people are moving, and it's quite interesting to see the photograph on the lower right, which is what he calls the ecumenopolis, and the ecumenopolis is basically a very large, continuous city uh, that goes all over the earth, anticipating the growth of population. He says 2100, we're not there exactly yet, but you can see if we're there or not by looking at the night uh, photographs of the earth with the lights, and you can see how this is happening. There is no question he was a really visionary, that's why we call Doxiadis vision. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Spiro. Now, um, it's interesting because we talk about uh, city planning and um, the way he looks upon it like a living organism that is expanding. And he envisioned it expanding in certain directions, in certain ways, in certain, um, in certain specific um, ways in which the people would essentially be responsible for how the city grows. Um, now, that has not perhaps taken into account um, what you mentioned very clearly, the population explosion. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, he may have even used the word of the population bomb yes. at some point. Yes. Uh, uh, and it's, it really is an explosion. So even though Islamabad is still only 1.2 million, you have... Uh, he designed another project, which is the Kurangi Township in, in Karachi, which is about 2.8 to 3 million people. And that is a very different story. Islamabad still has a certain form and structure to it. And it's grown in certain directions, and people may not be happy with what has happened, but it still has, if I'm not mistaken, uh, almost the same land area of parks national parks and uh, city parks, as there are uh, residential areas, the same area in Islamabad. It's one of the rare cities in Pakistan that has an equal uh, amount of land for parks and for, for uh, residences and, and construction. Kurangi, on the other hand, which was designed as a township, has none of those anymore. And perhaps you might, I'm, I don't know, I'm bringing you away from, from Islamabad, we can go back to it but perhaps a little word about the Kurangi Township and uh, what the original plan there was and what led to its demises, as we might call it, because it's no longer the, the town that Doxiadis planned. Correct. Actually, Sahed, we have, the, the, if you can go to Z, uh, we have the entire lecture in pieces, so we can pick and choose whatever we want to do. So we can go to Kurangi, Kurangi directly, Kurangi, yeah, if you yeah, prefer. Sure. No, no, for a little while, so we, and then we can move back to, to Islamabad and, and talk more about Doxiadis' vision. Yes, in a way, Kurangi is very interesting to all of us uh, because it's, uh, it is not a success, as you know. And uh, if you went to Kurangi, uh, the master plan, very good. So uh, if we go, uh, does it say, Kurangi there, yes. So, uh, this is how it relates to uh, Karachi. And uh, you can see where is the area. But we have to go to see what was the scope of that master plan. And basically, at that time, there were all the immigrants coming from India. They were poor. They 
were, did not have a place to stay, and uh, Pakistan wanted to create new townships for those people to live. And uh, the situation was really terrible, as we say. Unhealthy, obstructing the smooth operations of the city. By the way, these words are taken from his diaries. And we see a photograph of the refugee settlements in Karachi in the late 50s. If we go to the next slide, uh, which I'm going to move. Uh, now, actually, yes, here it is. We see that there were 120,000 families without a shelter. 30,000 families living in permanent houses under high, uh, 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 high density and acceptable densities. And they needed 150,000 houses. That's a big number. So the point of Korangi was to house all these people. When Doxiadis was presented with a problem, he was presented to create a place for all these people to live. And uh, he asked how these people are going to work. What are they going to do every day? And the answer was that they're going to go to Karachi. Karachi is not far away. But uh, that was not possible. It was not possible because there was not the capacity of the transportation to move them to Karachi. But furthermore, it was expensive. These people did not have the money to move. So Doxiadis' idea was to create a place that uh, it would be uh, also a place that uh, people would live and they would work as well. And uh, let's go to see what he was planning for Korangi. And you can see again the sectors. And you can see two axes. One axis is for the light industry, because he needed light industry for the jobs creation. By the way, let me say that the creation of jobs is the number one issue for any city planning. Uh, and this is how we approach it, and that's why uh, economists are fundamental in thinking on how a city is going to be built. And then on the other axis, he had the institutions, special buildings and offices and uh, businesses. And then he had the vertical axis that was for the administration, for the civil and the commerce areas. So you can see the axis and you can see the sectors and you can see that within the sectors there are several areas that they're going to be the parks and they're going to be all the centers and so on. So that was the, the plan of Korangi, and here we see 1959. And uh, the vision was to create all these things, but also he was concerned of having a mix of incomes. Uh, the point was that uh, although we have a tendency to think that we should plan uh, townships for the rich people and for the elite, uh, they need support from very different socioeconomic level people, and uh, they cannot really travel back and forth long distances. So we have, the city has to accommodate all of them, and here we're talking about large areas. We're not talking about a small piece of land. So within the city, we have to accommodate where the different incomes are going to, to live. And when he talks about mixed income, uh, he does not think about drastically mixed income, but rather uh, having a, a way to mix, but also to degrade as we go to different parts of the city. So at the end of the day, it would be a self-sufficient community providing employment opportunities to all its residences. Now, self-sufficient communities, it's very important today as we look at sustainability, and I have some slides to talk about it later. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think you've touched upon a very interesting point because the self-sustainability implies that, and you've mentioned another very important issue, which I think is not just peculiar to Pakistan, but in Pakistan we're very familiar with it, the socioeconomic differences in classes. And the fact that, as, an, as a simple example, when, you, when somebody builds a house, they not only live in that house, but they have domestic servants. Where are the servants going to come from? Are they going to travel 
for miles away and come and work there and then go back in the evenings or are they going to live there? Are they going to be housed in the same place? Do they have localities where they can go back and forth? Uh, and this socioeconomic difference survives to this day. It wasn't just in the 50s. It's perhaps even more exacerbated today. So planning a city uh, is not just for the elite, as you mentioned. It's not just making sure that the roads work and everything else seems to work for where people can drive around in cars with their chauffeurs. But you need to have public transport. You need to have people going back and forth. You need to have pedestrian zones. You, could, you need to have places where people can ride their bicycles. Or, you know, they travel back and forth by any means possible. Um, now, how do you bring about low-income living settlements alongside high-income living settlements within a smaller area, say like Kurangi or even Islamabad? Uh, how, do you, how do you bridge that gap uh, within the two? Because that's a, that's a major issue. Because people say, well, I don't want to live in this, this locality because there's a slum right next door, because low-income neighborhoods tend to be looked upon as slums. So how do you, how do you uh, get rid of that problem? Well, uh, we have to remember that these pieces of land are huge. Uh, I often compare them to sizes that uh, we all know and visit, like central London or Manhattan. Uh, for example, DHA city, Karachi, is uh, as big as half of Manhattan. So imagine you're planning such a big area. So you, that, I want to see it from the point of view that there is opportunity to do very many different things. So you do that by differentiating between single family homes, by multi family residences, although these days we want to move away from the single family homes because simply it's not an efficient way to use land, and also by the size of the plots. So we can have as small plots, and I'm talking about what happens today in Pakistan, there are small plots of 125 square yards all the way to 2,000 uh, square yards, and uh, you don't put a 2,000 square yard next to the 125. You segregate, but you put the 125 close to the 250, and the 250 close to the 500, and the 500 next to 1,000. So you, you try to scale them in a way that you have a, a gradient, and beyond the gradient, what you do, because you have uh, parks and green areas, uh, you can always uh, actually uh, differentiate among the different areas. Uh, here I have to say that Doxiadis was a pragmatism, a pragmatist. Uh, many times he was asked to do different things, and uh, including here in Pakistan, as he writes in his diaries, and he was saying, uh, let's do what we sh should do that it's going to work today, and I'm going to make a provision for something like this to work tomorrow. I can give you a nice story about it. Uh, he was asked in Islamabad to create a city that people are going to fly with small uh, car airplanes from one place to another. <laughs> and uh, he answered, according to what he writes in his diaries, very seriously, uh, let's do it for cars that we know that we have them today, but I will take care so whenever we have the cars that they fly, they're going to be uh, easily used in what I'm planning to use. And of course he says, I don't believe I'm going to see that in my lifetime. But uh, <laughs> anyway. That's interesting. Um, now, DHS City, uh, if I remember correctly, when you first started talking about DHA City with the authorities, they were only interested in um, plots and houses, basically like an extension of Defense Housing Authority in, in Karachi. Um, I think you convinced them that that's not how a new city, the DHA City, for those of you who are not aware, is a city that's being planned just out on the outskirts of Karachi 
Uh, it's a huge area, as uh, Spiro said, it's half the size of Manhattan, and it's for 600,000 people, am I correct? Sorry. Min minimum. Many I, more. Or not minimum, it's going to be many, many more. more. Okay, yes, many six, more. Okay, originally 600,000 people, many more now. Uh, now, uh, planning a city for 600,000 people where all you're going to have is defense housing society type houses uh, was not a good idea because those people who are going to live there, the elite, will want people to come and work for them. They need services. People who come and work for them will have children. They need parks. They need schools. They, and then you have to have schools for the rich. You have to have schools for the poor because the rich are not going to send their kids to the same schools that the poor are going to go to. We know that. Uh, we can pretend all we like, but I've heard such comments like, hi, hi, they come to our schools. Uh, I'm sorry, I spoke yes, in, spoke in Urdu, but I hear this all the time. Um, so that is something that you convinced the DHA authorities for, of doing. Is that correct? And you had uh, this plan to have all income levels there. Plus, I think you also have made provision for access, uh, which is access to all services and facilities for all income groups that are going to be housed in this, in this, in this city. It's going to be, right. Yeah. Th thank you, Shahid. Uh, let's go back to some history. By the way, at some point, I would like to show a few slides on Korangi and why it failed and what was the reason. But let's keep that no, for later. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you brought it up. If you hadn't, I would have asked you. Yes. But uh, let's go yes. to your question. Yes. So uh, let's go back to look at some history. Uh, I was uh, studying Doxiadis, as I told you, and I happened to be in Dubai for business. And uh, as you know, in Dubai on Fridays, it's, everything is closed. So I did not have much to do. And uh, I asked my friends at the Doxiadis Associates firm in Athens. Uh, I told them I'm going to go to Islamabad. Uh, chances was that the Greek ambassador in Islamabad was a childhood friend of mine. Uh, so I arranged to go to Islamabad. But Doxiadis Associates told me that they were working with uh, some very fine people in Karachi, uh, an engineering company called Osmani, and uh, they said, you have to meet with them because uh, they are very nice, energetic people and very young also. So uh, I arranged to go to Islamabad, and uh, I also met them in Karachi, and uh, Arif Osmani tells me there is a competition by DHA for a new city that's going to be 50 kilometers away. Uh, do you want to try it together? And uh, I said, fine, as long as we can apply acoustics, as long as we can apply all these theories. He says, absolutely, this is what we're going to do. And uh, eventually, uh, we got the project through a certain process. Uh, I'm not very familiar with how this happened, but I know that I was here. Uh, there were times that they were coming from Boston, uh, even uh, every week to, to Karachi. And I remember the first meeting we had with the DHA administration uh, when they told us that this is going to be what we call uh, in the United States a bedroom community, and in the UK it's called the dormitory community. And uh, we said, there is no way to do that. It's 50 kilometers away. Uh, there is no train. Even if there is train, we calculated what the capacity of the train would be. And we said, there is no way for people to live here and go and work to Karachi and come back. It has to be a self-sustainable city. And of course, we employed all these arguments that you saw today. And I was very surprised to hear almost immediately they said, yes. Do it. So this is how it started. But I remember we took a chance because, you know, when you have a job and you are a consultant, you don't want to say to the client what they should do. You rather do what they tell you to do. But here uh, we said, okay, if it is a dormitory community, we're not the right people to do it. Uh, of course, they had in mind the DHA areas in Karachi that they were mostly for residences. Uh, interestingly enough, in DHA city, they had already sold, they had, they had sold the plots, they had not balloted them yet, and they needed 
as soon as possible to have a plan so they could ballot them and they could allocate the plots to people who had paid already for different sizes of uh, plots. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, um, you mentioned the problems of Korangi. Um, let me uh, expand it a little. Um, there's another project that I had mentioned earlier, which is the LDA city in Lahore, which I believe is also subject to certain problems, which I won't get into. I don't want to get into any controversies. Uh, you're probably better, better equipped to do that. Uh, but Korangi, um, from being from Karachi, I know that Korangi uh, failed for several reasons. I have my own reasons. I'll, I, can, I can hint at some of them, but I'm sure you know them better than I do. Um, Karachi expanded exponentially. Um, the city became chaotic when it no longer was the capital and the capital moved to Islamabad. Karachi became a neglected city. Uh, Kurangi Township fell into ne total neglect. Um, various ethnic groups moved in. The land mafias took over. The entire planning of Kurangi Township, the amenity plots disappeared, the schools disappeared, the parks disappeared, the hospitals disappeared, the community centers disappeared and nothing remained of the Korangi plan. Uh, now, am I wrong or am I exaggerating? No, you, and I'm you, not you, sure what the LDA city uh, problems are, but maybe you'd like to talk first about Korangi. Yes, uh, if we can go to the implementation of Korangi, which is uh, very good. So here, Doxi we read from Doxiadis travel diaries of the 60s. Uh, notice that Korangi is a little earlier than Islamabad and says he, that he had noticed that things were not going well. There was a lack of infrastructure, community centers were not developed, illegal shops and structures began occupying public space. And he writes, now we reach a square where there is no building at all. It is the community square. It is meant to be a garden, but certainly nothing has happened yet. It is one corner of it that we see a woodcutter who is cutting and selling wood. And then says, we have provisions for these types of shops and people in the markets, so this is something unauthorized and it has to be into the places meant for firewood stores. And he questions why it is unorganized like this. If we look at more slides on He continues and says, I'm disappointed by the simple planning which has only led to vast space, which were supposed to become the heart of the city to remain in full waste. It is disappointing to see the wide streets not planted, not paved, not cleaned. Most of them really are sewers. This is a policy which should not be continued. There is a necessity for much more compact building and the creation of shopping centers and all community facilities and the proper places. And as you know, there are people who complain that there are not all these things there, but you can see how he writes in his own uh, diaries. Which, are, which date, back, date back to the 60s, if I'm not mistaken, is that correct? Uh, yes. 60s and early 70s, uh, yes? Yeah. No, very earlier. And, and then, oh, much earlier, and then we see more. The, the re return to the uh, hotel, discuss with Mr. Zafar. Anyway, let me not go over all these things, but let me go to the bottom line. And here we have a lot of uh, records from his diaries. When, again, as I told you, it's really a joy to read. And uh, let's look at why it failed. It failed primarily because there was no implementation of the plan. There was no authority that was able to follow. The infrastructure was not built. Uh, money was not spent for the infrastructure. So although they gave him the opportunity to plan a city, in a way it developed like a settlement without order. Now, I hear that this is common in Pakistan until today. And I hear that one of the great advantages of some societies like the DHA is that they enforce the bylaws. And uh, if you buy a piece of land, they feel more or less comfortable they have it, although we hear very many stories. So basically, uh, the occupants abandoned Korangi, they created new squatter settlements, and since we're running out of time, let me go a little faster and show you 
that uh, different aerial views of uh, Korangi, the Korangi, this is 2004, uh, and you can see the undeveloped areas are the red ones, and then you see in 2010, 2018, you see how it has been developed, but more important, you can see on the left how it was planned and what happened. And if I continue here, uh, this is how it was planned on the left, how it happened. Here you see that most community centers are still unoccupied, they're open land. Uh, and uh, you see that there are no green spaces, very few parks, very few pockets, but mostly it's open like this. And if you see the photographs of the area that you can see that residential streets are unpaved and also in bad condition, and uh, there is waste pollution. And here, look at the red part, which are the informal settlements. So a city is planned and many informal settlements are happening there. And you see that the informal settlements are basically in the areas that are supposed to be the community centers. If I, can, if I can just add an anecdote to that on Karangi Township, there was an uh, ADB finance project on water and sewerage to upgrade the water and sewerage uh, plan for, for Korangi. And the whole project was planned, it was designed, and it was even approved by the board. It was basically planned in the office of the Karachi Water and Sewerage Board. What had actually happened was that the real water and sewerage system in Korangi had been redesigned by its own residents, and what they had in the, on, on paper, the maps they had in the KWSB office, did not match the real world. So the project, which was approved, had to be cancelled because it was found that it didn't match reality. So the whole project had to be cancelled. It was one of the largest projects on water sewerage rehabilitation that was being financed in, in the city of Karachi, and it had to be cancelled because the people that were now running Korangi had basically taken it over and it was, there was complete disorder over there. Uh, now, uh, we have some time, about 10 minutes for questions, would you like to take? Or is there something else you would well, like to say? Well, we'd not discuss about Islamabad. Oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, yes. but we talked no, about no, no. Korangi. No, no, no. Uh, we've talked about Korangi. And uh, maybe some words about Islamabad, about where you think that vision ended up and did it live, live up to its expectations and where it may or may not have uh, succeeded? Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, Islamabad is, uh, has more or less followed what was supposed to be followed, but only in a very small part of it. Uh, initially, it included uh, many sectors in uh, Pindi uh, that have not been done, and also several sectors in Islamabad, they have not been done further away from the administrative buildings, the sector F6 and so on. Uh, over there, things are not going also well because what happens is uh, the type of buildings that they have been built for residences, and I have some photographs, but probably we can skip that, uh, is that uh, they, the density is high, but the typology of the houses does not follow the ten density. So the houses have been built like if it was not so dense. As a result, there is no sunlight in the lower parts of the house, the lower floors of the houses. There is no fresh air. They are very condensed, but not in an organized way to accommodate several families. Uh, at the same time, uh, certain areas that they needed to be green, they have not been. Uh, Actually, uh, they have been violated and buildings have been built there. Let me show very quickly, if you can go to Z, and if you can go to uh, the uh, Islamabad concept, let me show you just very quickly one more issue that I would like to address. Uh, and that is that as you see the sectors on the right, uh, you see that there are a lot of green areas. And that means that Doxiadis was willing to violate his principle of the two by two kilometers with all these houses, and he was allowing nature to enter the city, which is very important. So he was not just going there and flattening everything. He was trying to keep the uh, topography, he was trying to keep the nature, he was trying to allow the uh, birds and small animals to go 
in uh, Islamabad in the different parts of, according to these uh, green corridors. And this is something else that has by violated as well. In other words, there is a tendency and has been done just to erase everything, make it flat, destroy nature completely, destroy ecology, and simply start building there. Uh, let me stop here. This is uh, the important thing. But you can see the sectors on the right. I think you, you touched upon something very briefly right at the very end, that the tendency was to sort of flatten everything and then build anew. I believe the new idea behind acoustics that you are working on and uh, part of this softness program, etc., is to use the topography as it exists and build around the existing topography rather than change the topography. Yes. Uh, Doxiadis was thrilled with the use of computers. But in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, computers big as this room they could not do even what uh, a smartphone does today. Actually, it's about one uh, over a million of what a smartphone can do today. Uh, but he believed in the future of computers. Unfortunately, he did not live to see that. I can give you an anecdote very quickly. Uh, the head of computers uh, entered in his office in the elevator with him, and uh, Doxiadis asked him, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm the head of computers. And he looked at him and says, your salary is doubled. Go to human resources and tell them you're going to get twice as much as you get, without even asking how much he was getting. And this is a story that not only I have read, but it happened to be in the same dinner table uh, once with that person. And uh, he confirmed that this happened exactly like this. Uh, today, if I would say about ecistics, how it's progressing and how we have applied it to DHA city Karachi that unfortunately we don't have time to show, um, it has two major interventions uh, without taking anything away from the original ideas. One is the use of computers, which allows us to map the two by two kilometer into any kind of topography we have, any kind of boundary uh, and at the same time to preserve the topography and have different means to know what is the slope, uh, different areas, and also have large databases with information about birds, about fauna, and so on, and so on. So the first is computers. The second one is sustainability and making the city sustainable and self-contained based on a circular economy that basically uh, we try to waste almost nothing and we recycle and we reuse. I wish I had the time to present all these things, yes. but we do not. Yes, and you know, that's another very important issue. I mentioned water and sewerage where it failed in Korangi, but there's also waste management, and that's a major issue for all cities. And I think the whole uh, holistic plan behind acoustics is that you incorporate all of these into the into the planning planning system. So acoustics as a as a system is extremely self-contained and covers all bases. Um, unfortunately, when it's put into practice, depending on who's putting it into practice, the planners themselves, the builders themselves, they tend to violate those rules. And if you stick to the rules, I think we could have much better cities. I think that's the, the, the real message of this, of this whole, whole presentation. Um, so um, without any further ado, we still have maybe just a few minutes, so one or two questions. And if you can please confine it to questions rather than any comments, please. It would be much appreciated. Thank you. And um, can we have this light turned off a little so I can see, uh, or have the lights on so I can see people in the audience? I can't see anything at the moment. OK, now I can. Yeah, Professor, there we go. could you please shed some light <clears throat> on the public transport provision in the original master plan of Islamabad? Yes. Uh, Islamabad was built primarily on uh, using uh, cars, private cars. Uh, so attention was paid to a large extent for pedestrians. And uh, between ped pedestrians and uh, private cars, they were buses, but uh, the emphasis was either pedestrians or private cars. Remember, at that time, private cars were very much uh, used and we could not see the negative parts. But I want to emphasize the pedestrians part. Very many cul-de-sacs, very few intersections when people were walking, uh, 
so he was basically eliminating the cars from entering uh, in the small neighborhoods, in this, uh, in this uh, subsector with the center number three, for example, uh, cars almost never enter unless they go to a particular plot. And uh, so that, that was the great advantage of that. Today, as we do all these things, we take into consideration the public transportation, and we even propose from the very beginning, when the plan is made, how the routes of buses and the BRT is going to be. Uh, unfortunately, metro is very expensive to, to be done in all these developments. Uh, this is a good question to ask, by the way, uh, in the, and I want you to see through the lens of what we're discussing today, all the new cities that are being developed right now in Pakistan, including in Lahore. If you look all around Lahore, you see so many different developments. But thank you for the question. That, that's a very good question. Gentleman here. <clears throat> I've got two short questions. One is, of course, uh, the failure of Korangi, uh, which is basically a, a poor-based planning system. And the so-called success of the DHAs in Pakistan, which is basically money-based. So, in my opinion, it eliminates the necessity of a good planner. Because I think with money, anybody can good plan. And it will succeed, number one. Number two, could you possibly give us example of other cities and towns that uh, Duxaris uh, planned? And then we can compare why... Kurangi failed, why Islamabad is still actually working, so that we can just derive out the strength of the planner, where it fails and how it succeeds. Thank uh, you. Uh, Spirit, this is the last question. We've just been told that time is over, so uh, if you can answer this one and then we'll close the session. I would say that almost all the plans have not been implemented the way they were supposed to be implemented. Uh, you can see uh, Doxiadis' vision, for example, uh, Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia, was designed by him, planned by him. Uh, many other parts in the world had been planned by him. Islamabad, I would say it is the best example of something that worked up to a point pretty well. Now, uh, it's, uh, when you say the planner, probably you mean the town planner, you mean the planning authority that accepts these plans. Because the ideas with Doxiadis were there, but they were not implemented. And uh, you need to have a good client. I'm going to tell you something very simple that I always say to my students. In order to have a good project, you need to have a good client. So that's, the, that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Spiro. Uh, for a very interesting uh, uh, conversation, incredible information. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. A good round of applause for Spiro Polalis.